Good evening. Welcome uh, to our third midweek season, our uh, Lenten uh, service. Uh, everything is in the worship folder for you this evening. We're uh, pleased to welcome Pastor Lyon from WLC, uh, who will deliver uh, the hands of the passion message uh, for us this evening. Uh, we pray that God will bless us and strengthen us in uh, this season of Lent, uh, that we might appreciate uh, the gift that he has given us and all that he has done for us. We begin our worship with the opening hymn. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Father, I have sinned against you and am no longer worthy to be called your child. Yet in mercy you sacrificed your only Son to purge away my guilt. For his sake, O God, be merciful to me, a sinner, and in the joy of the Holy Spirit, let me serve you all my days. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Upon this, your confession, I forgive you all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Thanks be to God. Amen. Lord God, we thank you for this day of grace now drawing to a close. Stay with us and warm our hearts with your forgiving love in Christ. May your word keep our faith burning brightly 
that we may walk in the light of your presence through the darkness of this world. Come and bless us as we worship you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. portion of the Passion history as Mark records it in the 14th chapter of his gospel is entitled Gethsemane. You will all fall away, Jesus told them, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered, but after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Peter declared, even if all fall away, I will not. I tell you the truth, Jesus answered, today, yes, tonight, before the rooster crows twice, you yourself will disown me three times. But Peter insisted emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the others said the same. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. Stay here and keep watch. Going a little further, he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Could you not keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Once more he went away and prayed the same thing. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. They did not know what to say to him. Returning the third time, he said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Enough. The hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. So far, the Passion reading. All we, like sheep, have gone astray, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. By his wounds we are healed.
God's grace, his mercy, and his peace are yours through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The word of God for our consideration is recorded in John's Gospel, chapter 13. After he had said this, Jesus was troubled in his spirit and testified, Very truly, I tell you, one of you is going to betray me. His disciples stared at one another and at a loss to know which of them he meant. One of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. Simon Peter motioned to his disciples and said, Ask him which one he means. Leaning back against Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, It is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. Then dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. As soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. So Jesus told him, What you are about to do, do quickly. But no one at the meal understood why Jesus said this to him. Since Judas had charge of the money, some thought Jesus was telling him to buy what was needed for the festival or to give something to the poor. As soon as Judas had taken the bread, he went out, and it was night. This is the word of our God. Dear friends in Christ, when I was a a student at Wisconsin Lutheran Seminary, we learned about a 19th century theologian, and if I'm completely honest, I don't remember anything about him, but I know that every time we heard his name, the entire class would suddenly burst out with a His name was Samuel Simon Schmucker. And I know that that every time we heard his name, that we we didn't like him and we were going to be disgusted. But how many years later, I'd have to go back and look why that even was. There are names that we hear from time to time that evokes such a reaction. You think about names that you don't call people anymore. A Benedict Arnold. I can't remember exactly what Benedict Arnold ever did, but I know that when I hear Benedict Arnold, it means that that he was a betrayer and you don't call someone that. If you call someone a Jezebel, we know what that means. And you hear these kind of names, and, and and it makes you want to furrow your brow and look at them with disrespect and spit on the ground. Few names evoke such a reaction especially among Christians, as Judas. Think about what we call Judas. Greedy. Money hungry. The betrayer. The man who would turn his Savior in just so that he could line his own pockets with some more money. This is the kind of guy that we look at and we spit on the ground and disrespect every time we hear his name. And you might say he earned it. He betrayed Jesus. Innocent blood, he betrayed Jesus over to the hands of sinful men and how callous he was in doing it. Later that night after the reading, when when they're in the Garden of Gethsemane and he callously goes up and, and kisses Jesus on the cheek and has the gall to call him rabbi. Judas is not someone that automatically earns our respect. But let me throw a few other describers out at you for Judas. What if we call Judas the evangelist? The one whom Jesus sent. The soul. The soul for whom Jesus gave his own life. Perhaps if we take a closer look, the heart of Judas, the sinful yet loved heart of Judas, is not so far from our own. Remember what it was like that night, that Maundy Thursday before Jesus died? 
The disciples were all gathered together in the room. And what did Jesus do? Knowing everything that each of those disciples was going to do, knowing everything that was going to happen in the next 24 hours, Jesus showed his ultimate service by getting down on his hands and his knees and washing his disciples' feet, knowing exactly who they were. And then in a turn, he told them, one of you is going to betray me. Mark tells us that, that all the disciples looked at each other and, and said, surely not I. Here in our text for tonight, John tells us that, that his disciples stared at one another at a loss to know which of them he meant. One of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, that's John, how he refers to himself, was reclining next to him. Simon Peter motioned to this disciple and asked, ask him which one he means. Leaning back against Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? Can you just imagine how each of those disciples would have gone through their own roller decks of their past sins, asking themselves the question, could it be me? Am I capable of betraying my Savior, Matthew, the tax collector, who is all too familiar with cheating people for the sake of his own pockets? James and John, the ones who were the so-called sons of thunder who were lobbying for a seat next to Jesus, leaving all the other disciples behind? Peter, the outspoken leader of the disciples who sometimes didn't know when to shut his mouth? Could they betray Jesus? I can just imagine how each of them went through their own records and realized a terrifying truth. Perhaps the fear that set in for them at that moment was not just fear because Jesus was really good at predicting the future, but it was fear that set in because they knew it. It could be me. I could betray my Savior. So the question before you and me tonight is, could you? And how easy it is for us to disregard that question because that was 2,000 years ago. It's a hypothetical. We weren't there. We weren't one of the 12. No, I couldn't betray Jesus. I'm not even going to go down that path of answering that question. But if you think about it, if the only thing we have to hang our hat on is that we weren't there 2,000 years ago and we weren't one of the 12 disciples, all that means for you and me is that we are capable of betraying our Savior without ever having to look him in the eye. Without ever having to callously kiss him on the cheek to his face. Maybe the reality is that I could betray my Savior. And I wouldn't even have to look at him to do it. Consider what you've traded Jesus in for. What relationship have you valued over and above any other relationship? What sport have you idolized? What, what ideology have you held at the expense of your Savior? The Jesus who called you, who loved you, who gave his life for you, who died for you. We've traded him in for far less. Never had to look him in the eye. Consider how Satan's siren call calls out to us each and every day in so many different ways to pull us away from Jesus, to trade Jesus in for something far less. And we listen to it time and time again. Are we really going to say that it's a good thing I wasn't one of the 12? It's a good thing I wasn't there 2,000 years ago? Is God really impressed with us? Judas betrayed Jesus. 
And he was a broken man because of it. If you've ever felt that kind of guilt, the kind of guilt that leads to such despair, that would cause you to think that no one could possibly love you, no one could possibly save you, no one let alone God, if you've ever been in that spot of such despair that you thought that not being here on this earth is a better option for you, if that's where you are tonight, I want you to take one thing away from this. Jesus loves you. Jesus dies for you. And he lives for you. In Christ, there is always hope. And yeah, what, what Judas went through was, was, was difficult. And, and, and think about how his own spiritual leaders let him down. When he walked into the chief priest's and, and pled that he was guilty of this man's blood, they said, go away, we don't care. His own spiritual leaders let him down at that moment. Judah's story is a tragic story. It breaks my heart every single time I hear it. Because I know that the same heart that beat in Judah's chest beats in my own. And it beats in yours too. But dear friends, do not despair. There's hope for you. Because you have a Savior who gave his life, he does not say to you, depart from me, I never knew you. No, he says, welcome. You are broken no more. He brings you to himself and gives you the confidence to know that no matter how bad your sins are, he died for them. He showed you his love for you. And you have nothing to fear. Judas reasoned that Jesus couldn't possibly love him for what he had done and what a, what a tragic conclusion he reached. So for you, dear friends, know that God doesn't bow to your sins. He forgives them. There is no sin that is too great for your Savior. So as we look, as we continue to look to the, the passion hands, and tonight the passion hands of Judas, may those passion hands remind us of our own. And may they serve as, as a reminder that, yes, I am capable of betraying my Savior too, but if those are the only hands you're looking at, then you're missing the most important part. See the hands that Jesus had pierced for you. The hands that, that Jesus gave for you and the hands that now welcome you as his own child. The one he gave his life for. Don't ever lose hope. Don't despair. Jesus has won the victory for you once and for all, and because of that, you are his own dear child. So in his hands, we are safe, we are forgiven, we are his, now and forever. Amen. Please stand. Dear Jesus, blessed Redeemer, we know that the trials, the suffering, the humiliation, bitter agony, and death which you endured were all for us. You consented to carry our burden of sin in your body and to feel the terrible weight of their guilt upon your conscience. Yes, you even consented to sacrifice yourself for our sin to make amends with God on our behalf. Our hearts are saddened when we think upon our many sins, but they're filled with rejoicing when we think upon your cross knowing that it is the altar upon which you secured our redemption. Though we have sinned against God in countless ways and times without number, yet your suffering and death have opened to us the door to eternal life. 
Precious Savior, give us grace always to remember in true faith and with contrite hearts what you and love have done for us. Give us also willingness and strength to follow you on faith's journey, even through heartbreak and suffering to eternal joy. Be with us in every temptation, helping us overcome, so that we may glorify you with a godly life and a steadfast faith. Keep us at all times from false security and from becoming careless and indifferent in things spiritual. Help us to overcome the weaknesses, the fears, and the sinful desires of our flesh. Grant our spirits that they may ever be filled with watchfulness and prayer. Forgive our sins, for you suffered and died for them. Through your merit and intercession, move our Father in heaven to give us all those things which we need. For it is in your name that we join to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. All praise to you, our God, this night, for all the blessings of the light. Keep us, yes, keep us, King of Kings, beneath your own almighty wings. Forgive us, Lord, through your dear Son, for sins that we this day have done, that as we sleep, peace we would hold with you, with you within our souls. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Father's Son will be with us in truth and in love. Amen. Please be seated. Welcome uh, to everyone, especially to uh, Pastor Lyon. Thank you for uh, your message uh, from God's Word this evening. What a great hymn week it was at church. Two, two hymns that, that are going to be in my funeral for sure. Uh, Lord, Lord, Thee I love with all my heart and Jesus' priceless treasure. Uh, the only downside is singing it with a mask and only singing a couple verses. You know, hopefully we'll get soon to the place where we can uh, belt these things out uh, once again. Um, I really don't have any announcements for you. Um, the uh, St. John's on the, on the Hill donation thing is going on. You can see that. Pastor Degner, it's got to warm your heart. There's a hole. I almost tripped right, fell right on my face coming around the corner uh, with all the stuff that is there. So, um, and we're keeping that going until... Okay. All right. Uh, so this evening is it. Okay. There you go. So they'll be gone after, after uh, tonight. Um, other than that, God's blessings uh, to you uh, throughout the week. Uh, may the love that Christ has shown to you uh, give you all hope and courage and uh, everything needful uh, to, to live a life that glorifies the one who's given all for, all for you. 